Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my Total War Warhammer 2 Potential Skaven Army video. Now, in this video, guys, we're going to go through the potential units that could be appearing for the Skaven in Total War Warhammer 2. We'll be primarily focusing on the Skaven 8th Edition Army, ignoring some of the Forge World models and ignoring some of the models that were introduced with the End Times events and, of course, models from earlier in Skaven's history. This is just because, not because I think they're any less valid than the 8th edition ones, but because Creative Assembly themselves have mainly been focusing on the 8th edition, and so your regular viewers to my channel will know for these army videos, I too have focused on the 8th edition armies, because that seems to be the place that, almost without exception, Creative Assembly have focused their efforts in. So... That out the way, let's just add a couple of more things here while I've got you guys. There's a couple of army rules that apply to a multitude of Skaven army units, much like the High Elves that I discussed previously in my High Elf army video, but some of them we can just discuss. Some of them aren't really implementable in Total War Warhammer 2, but some of them can be. So the first one we're going to discuss is Scurry Away, which is a rule that a lot of the Skaven units have. And that's the idea that the Skaven aren't particularly known for their bravery. If the opportunity to brand itself to escape and live to fight another day, they will jump at that chance. And so what this rule used to do was give them an additional plus one to a roll for their distance that they would flee in when they were either fleeing from a charging enemy unit or just running away from combat in general. Now, this is actually one I think could be implemented by Creative Assembly. It'd be very interesting to see the Skaven given the rule whereby once their morale is broken, their speed actually increases and they can run away faster to perhaps regroup and come back or just to run away for good. Now, the Skaven aren't on a particularly slow race to start with, so I think that could be a potentially interesting mechanic to add to Total War Warhammer 2. Another rule is the rule Strength in Numbers, where by gathering in large numbers, the Skaven gain a modicum of bravery and self-confidence and, you know, are happier to attack. Now, this had a lot to do with uh, ranks and a lot of different aspects of the tabletop game. But it could be simplified, again, to perhaps be applicable in Total War Warhammer 2. The way I see it is them doing it off a unit's health. So if a Skaven unit's health is, say, above 75% of its overall total, the Skaven get a leadership bonus. Once it starts dropping below that, or even 50%, they could fiddle around with that. But once it starts dropping below that marker, then they start to have leadership, well, not problems but they lose that bonus to their leadership once their numbers start to drop in any given unit and the final one is verminous valor now that is the idea that comes into challenges and this is one that really isn't implementable because there's no challenge system in total war warhammer but the idea was that a skaven leader um, could go into a challenge without necessarily gaining the disadvantage, or could escape a challenge without necessarily gaining any of the disadvantages. It won't really play. There's no clear way I can see it translated unless you make it something completely different. I also won't be covering any characters in this video. That I'm saving for my follow-up video to this, which for people who are new to my channel uh, will be coming up in a week or so, or a little bit less probably, on the likely legendary lords for Skaven. So look out for that coming up a little bit later, but characters uh, by name uh, won't be covered in this video. So that out of the way, guys, let's get on with the units and let's start with the lords, shall we? And the first lord we are going to discuss is the Warlord. Now the Warlord is very much the melee focused lord of the Skaven army. And as we've seen with many of the races in Total War Warhammer 2 so far, they seem to like the idea of a melee and kind of a more magic or range focused lord for the armies of Total War Warhammer 2. Now, a Skaven Warlord, in terms of his personality, is equal parts cunning and savagery. They tend to be bigger than your average Skaven, and they tend to have just been born slightly stronger, slightly larger, more often than not having this innate savagery as well, whereby most Warlords, when they grew up in their litters of little ratlings, 
were more than likely to have probably eaten one or two, if not all, of their brothers and sisters while they were growing up, making them that little bit more extra large and extra savage. But as I said, there is a cunning element to Skaven them as well. You have to be smart as well as brutally violent to really climb the ranks of Skaven them, because someone will outthink you if they can't outmuscle you, and you need to be able to defend on both flanks. Warlords tend to be in charge of Skaven clans or maybe even perhaps smaller than a full-blown clan in Skaven but they are adept at maintaining their power either through fear, intimidation, bribery, any which way they can to claw and fight for power and maintain the level of power which they've achieved but always being more ambitious looking to grow the influence of their clan looking to grow their own personal power base and on the lookout for any potential challengers at the same time so it must be exhausting work being a skaven warlord but they manage it nonetheless now in terms of rules uh, they do probably benefit from all of the rules I'd mentioned previously. They also get a different series of mounts. Now, Skaven mounts are very different from some of the other mounts we've had in Total War Warhammer. So they have the option of going for a Rat Ogre Bonebreaker, which is a special form of Rat Ogre, but we'll get into that a little bit later. They also have the option of a Great Pox Rat, which is an enormous diseased rat. Again, we'll get into the details of that a little bit later as well. But they also get the option of this, which is the war litter, which is kind of just a little platform they can get carried around on by their bodyguards. And uh, yeah, I think it'd be quite interesting to see that in Total War Warhammer 2. Not unlike, I suppose, the, uh, the dwarven uh, shield bearers. Uh, that we saw for some of the Dwarven units in Total War Warhammer 1. Now, in terms of their weaponry, there's a degree of variability here. So they have access to a hand weapon, heavy armor. They can take an additional hand weapon, a halberd instead, a shield instead, or a great weapon instead. So they might do what they've proposed to do for the High Elf armies in Total War Warhammer 2, which is draw a distinction between the Warlords and their kind of lesser version, the Chieftains, whereby one gets an anti-large bonus and one gets more of a melee-focused infantry bonus. Now, which one might be which in the Skaven army? I'm not 100% sure as of yet, but I imagine we'll get a bit of variety. That's probably a design uh, ethic they went into in designing Total War Warhammer 2 to try and differentiate their melee lords from their melee heroes. So that is the Warlord for you guys. Next up, we will look at the Greyseer. The Greyseers are considered chosen by the Skaven god, the Great Horned One. They are said to be marked at birth by having paler grey or even pure white fur, and when they're born, they have these little bony nubs on their skulls where horns will emerge if they survive that long. Greyseers are quickly taken into the tutelage of another Greyseer to teach them the ways of Skaven magic and how to control it. And this is a very perilous process that many don't even end up surviving. Much like all kinds of training in Skaven them, it tends to be an all or nothing game. You're really fighting for your life every single second of every single day just to make it to the next day, just to climb that ladder of power a little bit more, make it up that extra rung a day by day. But the Graciers are mostly conceived with adulation from the rest of Skaven them. In fact, their horns seem to give them a kind of respect and uh, some kind of honorific role within Skaven society whereby other Skaven they feel like they should slightly subjugate themselves to the Grey Seers. So the Grey Seers tend to take control of any environment they're in and in Total War Warhammer 2 these guys would be very much the magic user lords for the Skaven army. Now Grey Seers aren't immune to the political and power games of Skavenden and indeed themselves will try to build up their own power base from which they can call upon to increase their influence, to rise even maybe to the heavy heights of the, the Council of Thirteen itself. They're able to also order around warlords which is a fairly rare thing. They can call meetings with warlords. They can ally warlords with one another. So Skaven can come to common cause when there's a threat or an objective that the Gracia feels can be achieved or needs to be achieved. 
or is even perhaps a whisper of the great horned one himself. They also have access to different levels of Skaven magic that aren't achievable by others. They're the only ones who can summon forth what is known as a vermin lord, and they keep that secret very tightly guarded. A vermin lord, which we'll discuss very soon, uh, is only really summoned in the most dire of circumstances because a grey seer knows that by summoning a vermin lord, it actually risks the grey seer it's himself. So he tends to try and avoid it unless absolutely necessary. But they do guard that secret and are true masters of the two laws of Skaven magic of both Ruin and Plague, which are their two laws of magic. Now, I think I'll cover Skaven magic in perhaps a separate video, but just bear in mind there are two laws of Skaven magic and these guys have access to both. They also have access to something known as the 13th spell, which is kind of a special spell kept slightly separate from the other laws uh, that only a couple of character units have in the Skaven army. Now, on the tabletop, they had access to an item known as a warp token, and the idea was that a Skaven seer would eat this little bit of warp stone or a warp token, and that would earn them another dice when they were casting a spell to make it greater odds that that spell will go off. Now, imagine this actually being implemented in Total War Warhammer 2, but much like a consumable that you can only use, say, two or three times in a battle, and that increases their regenerate of mana. That's a good way I see that rule being translated. But all in all, Gracias, powerful magic users, very well respected, well, as far as respect goes amongst Skaven society, and they are powerful and, as I said, seem to be the chosen of the Horned Rat himself. So that brings us neatly on to the Vermin Lord. As we discussed, the Vermin Lord can only be summoned forth by a Gracia. The Vermin Lord himself is a demon of the Horned Rat, much like something like Bloodthirsters, which you, if you're new to Warhammer, may not have seen, but the big winged, sort of almost classical demon looking like creatures uh, you may have seen models of in Warhammer. They're uh, demons of corn, whereas the Vermin Lord is a demon of the Horned Rat. He gives off an aura of might and decay and is said to be extremely wise and knowledgeable and cunning, much like all Skaven, meant to be kind of the living embodiment of the ideal of Skavenness. Now, they are in equal measures said to be a majestic and disgusting, towering over the rest of the Skaven hordes. They can summon forth their weapon, the glaive, from the warp or the realm of chaos, whichever you, way you prefer to reference it, summon it forth as like from nowhere, and then just starts to lay swathes of destruction and murder down upon any who dare step up to challenge the Vermin Lord. Now, a couple of things about the Vermin Lord is that they have some innate abilities. They can said to be able to be so cunning that they can smell lies on you. They're constantly sort of twitchy and pacing, and that's said to go towards the idea that they're always thinking, always processing, always running through schemes and how best to overcome them. Now, Vermin Lords are a bit of a weird one because I have included them in the Lords section for this video, and on the tabletop, they are Lords in that category. But for what I've been doing for most of these videos is for Lords, I've been essentially considering Lords potential general units for Total War Warhammer. But the Vermin Lord themselves has a special rule whereby they can't actually be the generals of their army. Because they are this summoned creature, it turns out they can't really lead armies, if I, if I remember the rule correctly. So we likely won't be seeing them as generals in Total War Warhammer 2 because they can't lead armies per se. But perhaps we'll see them as unique units, um, and that's how they'll be brought into the game as unique units, or you not unique units, but just rare units, or more interestingly, maybe just a summon that the Grey Seers can do, and they appear temporarily and then disappear again. That might be a way we see them implemented in the game as well. But I'd be very surprised once we get the full roster reveal whether Vermin Lords are up there as generals. That'd be very interesting to see. Now on the tabletop, they have a couple of special rules. They cause terror because it's a big demon rat and that is truly terrifying if you ask me. They are immune psychology because all things that cause terror tend to be immune psychology. They have a 5 plus ward 
which equates to a one-third ward, essentially, a 33% ward um, against all incoming damage. And their Doom Glaive does a lot of extra damage. So whereas a normal wound in Warhammer the Tabletop just counts as one, if you're wounded with the Doom Glaive, that is a roll of a dice with three sides. So they could do as much as three wounds compared to a normal unit's one for every time they wound an enemy unit. They also have access to both laws of Skaven Magic, much like the Gracier, and they have access to the 13th spell as well. As I mentioned, I'll probably do a separate video on the laws of magic for Skaven, so look out for that when it comes out. But that's the Skaven Vermin Lord. Quite an intimidating monstrosity on the battlefield. I look forward to seeing how Creative Assembly implement this rat demon in Total War Warhammer 2. So moving on from the Vermin Lord, let's go on to the heroes. Well, let's say let's say it's really hard to identify any of Skaven as heroes, but you get where I'm going with this one. So we have the Chieftain, effectively like the next rung down from the Warlords. Chieftains tend to be loyal to the Warlords themselves. Well, at least for the moment until they can spot their opportunity to rise to Warlord and take over any clan or tribe. So chieftains will be very much your melee focused heroes, they'll make your recruitment cheaper if it plays anything like Total War Warhammer 1, uh, so recruitment cheaper, training your troops, getting them more experienced from turn to turn, that's kind of the role these guys will play. And as I mentioned in the Warlord section, what Creative Assembly might do is much like with the High Elves, is have these melee heroes uh, slightly different from the Warlords in terms of giving maybe one of them anti-large, maybe one of them a weapon and shield, or maybe one of them anti-large and one of them just two hand weapons. It's hard to tell. They could go either way because both the Chieftain and the Warlord have a number of ways they can be armed on the tabletop, whether it be with Halberd, Great Weapon, two hand weapons, hand weapon and shield, all of them are options available to the way that Creative Assembly want to arm the Chieftains. So not really much to add on that. The Chieftains sitting in the wings, biding their time, sneakily, sneakily waiting to claw their way up, murder their Warlord, and take over probably at some point, should they have the cunning or strength or combination of both to do so. So after the Chieftains, we have the Warlock Engineers. Now the all Warlock Engineers all tend to come from Clan Scryer, who are kind of the master mechanics of Skaven them, really. They use a combination of arcane sorcery and science, or technology as we would describe it, but the Skaven don't see a distinction. It's only the other races of the Warhammer world. They're a little bit confused and find it hard to replicate some of the stuff the Skaven are able to do. But they merge technology with magic using Warpstone primarily as just the way they see magic being. They don't draw any kind of distinction between the two. Now for some, this can be some kind of like insane, mind-boggling mix of these two distinct forms of thinking, let's say. But the Skaven seem to find a way around it. Now, the Skaven Warlock Engineer can summon some form of Skaven magic, but no one's sure whether this is brought on by the technology they often wear upon themselves, or natural ability, or technology that adds to natural ability. It's all just a bit of a mystery to anyone other than the Warlock Engineers themselves. Now, Warlock Engineers are always kind of tinkering around with their technology, so much so that it actually expands to their own bodies, and they can often replace a tail with a mechanical tail, as in the model, or an arm, or an eye. They like to fidget with themselves. Now, sometimes this has been caused by a mishap of their own technology, and they've just blown off their own arm, or something like that, but more often than they're not it's actually by their own choice and as i said always powered by warpstone now an element to bear in mind if you don't know what warpstone is i may have mentioned it a couple of times in this video already but warpstone in the warhammer world is a physical embodiment of chaos magic of magical energy and the skaven more than any other race seek it out the other races do know of it and they do use it from time to time but none cherish warpstone as much as the skaven themselves so they love the stuff and a lot of them will 
have warp stone weaponry and the warlock engineers can be armed with a variety of things including some warp stone weaponry now in uh, the 8th edition of Warhammer, Warpstone weaponry was largely considered magical weaponry, which means that a lot of the missile and artillery units in the Skaven armies can do a lot of damage to ethereal units. So that's just something worth bearing in mind for when I mention that something might have warp weaponry later on in this army list, because they will destroy ethereal units from the undead or the little dwarven heroes that hang around with Belagar. All sorts of things can be very susceptible to some of the stuff Skaven have to throw at it. So that really kind of sums it up for the Warlock Engineers. Dastardly schemers with a gift for magic and technology. And they have access to the Lore of Ruin. And their signature spell, which they can trade out, is the spell Warp Lightning. But we'll get into that more in my Skaven magic video. But yeah, very interesting little creatures the warlock engineers i imagine they'll work very much like the dwarven engineers in total war warhammer one they'll add a little bonus to any kind of artillery or any kind of firing uh, weapon mechanism or missile infantry i think they'll boost whatever can throw or shoot in the skaven army and they'll have similar things to the dwarven engineers um, in Total War Warhammer 1 in terms of how they play on the battlefield one imagines. So that's the Warlock Engineers. Moving on to the Assassins. The Assassins of Clan Eshin. So the Assassins of Clan Eshin are the most elite warriors of Clan Eshin itself. Stealthy and deadly in equal measure. These guys are dexterous, they're speedy, they're murderous, they're cunning. They really do embody a lot of the attributes that Skavenhood seems to admire, or at least live by, if nothing else. They're so stealthy and secretive, in fact, that many amongst the surface world, and even in Skaven them themselves, are unaware of who they are and what they do. And those who do know about them fear them above all other threats in Skaven society. Passing down the traditions of assassination they learnt from the peoples of Nippon long ago, the Skaven assassins and Clan Eshin itself have been fine-tuning those martial skills adding in the skills that could only be attributed to creatures such as the Skaven, using every part of their body to kill and maim, and really mastering the art of assassination itself. They're so deadly, in fact, that many describe their shadows themselves as being deadly poisonous. And they fade into the shadows to such a degree that some say it's almost supernatural. These killers don't only specialize in killing, but are masters in arson, sabotage, and poisonings as well, they really help keep the idea of Skavendom out of the minds of the Empire or anyone who discovers any Skaven plot they happen to come upon. They're said to be very quick as well. When they do happen to make an appearance in open battle, they're said to be as quick as a galloping horse. So very speedy little rat men indeed. And much like the rats in our own world, they seem to be able to get anywhere. Nowhere is inaccessible to them. They either achieve it through stealth, through speed, through an almost innate ability to climb even the smoothest surface, there's nowhere you can go to escape the blades of a Skaven assassin. To achieve this level of deadliness, as I mentioned, these are the most elite warriors of Clan Eshin. They happen to be trained, and in the midst of their training, many of the candidates end up dying in the, the sort of deadly arts they have to study, and only the best of the best even survive the training to begin with. And as a graduation, they're actually sent on what are described as death missions. So if they actually manage to survive that, they graduate and they become a fully-fledged assassins in their own right. When it comes to battle and how they appear in the tabletop of the game, it's quite interesting, and I'm not exactly sure how Creative Assembly are going to implement them. On the campaign map, I know exactly, there'll be um, there'll be assassins. Uh, we've seen the attributes of assassins before in Total War Warhammer. Uh, so they'll fit very much into that mold on the campaign map. The issue is that on the in battles, what you do with an assassin is technically you'd end up hiding them in a unit. So 
when you're playing against a Skaven player, and they might have an assassin on their list, but you don't know where that assassin is. And the idea is that the assassins just dress themselves as a normal Skaven warrior and march with the rank and file of everybody else. But then only at the most opportune moment will they throw off their disguise, grab all their poison blades, and launch into a frenzied attack, trying to take out as many as they can, or even a specific target on the battlefield. Now, the way they've implemented models who do this before is really the best example we have in Total War Warhammer 1 are the Greenskin Fanatic but that has become more of a breath weapon now and I don't think you could have a hero be unleashed like a breath weapon so I think what they end up probably doing is just giving them stalk a hero of stalk very small radius of discovery and just allow them to quickly move around the battlefield maybe going to hunt down an enemy hero or something like that rather than necessarily have them hiding uh, within the ranks of your normal regiments although they find a way of doing that with your hero and allow you to like launch off your hero uh, from that that'd be amazing but I don't think we've ever seen any mechanics like it so far in Total War Warhammer but still fun to see but I think they'll probably just end up giving them stalk if I'm honest but, you know, it would have been a fun idea. On the tabletop, they have their two one-handed weapons, and they also have throwing stars. Uh, so they have a missile weapon as well. So it would probably play not dissimilarly to something like the Witch Hunter as a hero, but they'd probably be better in close combat than ranged. Uh, so you'd be, you'd be happy to fire off throwing stars while you had enemies far away, but don't hesitate to get your assassin up there in someone's face with their deadly blades. Now there is an upgrade to the assassin as well that has something, that have items like timed bombs and things like that, but I think that will probably be items you can equip or abilities you'll be able to equip as you upgrade your assassin hero, rather than necessarily having two separate types of unit for that. They, of course, also have poison, as I've mentioned poison numerous times. They'll coat all their weapons in poison, and because they're so dexterous and so quick, the idea is that they can kind of parry away anything that comes at them, and so they have a 50% ward save on the tabletop, so they'll probably have some sort of ward save built into them as well. So potentially can be quite hardy for what is kind of a quick strike unit, get in there kill something get away you don't i don't think you'd necessarily want to keep them in elongated combat but maybe hit hard get them out but with that ward save they could be really quite punchy as well um, i don't imagine they'll give them a ward save to that level in total war warhammer 2 but there we go that is the skaven assassin for you moving on to the plague priest now the Plague Priests are the most degenerate disciples of decay of Clan Pestilence. They worship the Horn Rat and the idea of decay and disease, and they are, as members of Clan Pestilence, amongst the forefront of the zealots of Clan Pestilence, looking to create a single disease that will wipe out all the surface dwellers so Skaven can rise to the surface and take over the surface world as well. So that's what they are. They're essentially religious zealots of the Horned Rat, but who feel that like disease is very much the way to go about bringing the prophecy of Skaven them taking over the whole world. Now, because these guys are such religious zealots, uh, they do focus on the concept of sort of ruling out all other ways of worship, all other ways of doing things traditionally other than the way they like to do it, other than sort of the way of Clan Pestilence, which might speak slightly to their isolationism, but these guys might be kind of a squishier warrior priest. They shouldn't be as like tough as the priests in the Empire, but they should have some kind of morale boost uh, or maybe even damaging aura because of the idea of uh, their horrific diseases and stuff around them uh, for the Skaven. Now, there is a chance, as many of you will know, I have uh, put forward the idea that there will be something known as uh, the lizard and the rat or the serpent and the rat or something along those lines as a downloadable pack later on in Total War Warhammer 2, focusing on the lizard men and the Skaven. Now, that I still think is very much going to happen 
But one of the key aspects of that conflict is that conflict is against a lizardman character known as the Prophet of Sotek and the Skaven clan known as Clan Pestilens, of which the Plague Priests are members of. Now, I do see the Plague Priests not necessarily making the cut as a hero class in the starting game, and rather them coming in with that DLC pack. If you'd like a bit more detail on my thinking on the DLC packs, and that one in particular, do check the top right-hand corner now, but just bear that in mind as we go forward when I mention the name Clan Pestilens, that that's what we're talking about, and a lot of these units might not be included and will be included in the future DLC packs. So just something to look forward to going forward. Now, as masters of disease and all things corrupting, they do countless experiments, usually on Skaven slaves, sometimes on surface dwellers as well, just really trying to perfect this perfect disease. And as such, as they're almost near worship of the, even the concept of disease drives them, they find pride in being the fact that they are simply walking vessels of disease themselves covered in weeping sores and boils, just dripping pus most of the time. Sometimes their flesh even ooze, seems to be oozing off their skin. They are so riddled with horrific disease. But they think of this as a blessing, a blessing from the Horned One himself, and they take great pride in their horrificness. Now, when these guys are all studying and creating these horrible disease, all of Clan Pestilence attests to something called the Book of Woe, which is where they write down all the horrific diseases they've come up with all over the years, and all the horrific things they've managed to invent, trying to build towards this perfect disease that will wipe out the entirety of the surface. So, you know, meticulous studies, if not sort of festering pustules of disease, vile bile, and vomitous muck. That's kind of the plague priest for you. You know, not handsome chaps, but they get a good amount of work done. They are also magic users. They have access to the lore of plague for the Skaven magic. They have a chosen spell known as Pestilent Breath, uh, which they can replace on the tabletop with another random spell if they happen to pick it. They also have Frenzy, much like their kind of, I don't want to say lesser, but their lesser cousin unit, the Plague Monks. These are sort of the most elite of the Plague Monks, the most zealous of them. And they have a couple of choices for mounts. They have something, a mount called the Plague Furnace, and they also have a choice of the mount known as the Great Pox Rat. Uh, which I've mentioned before with the Warlords. But that is the Plague Priest for you guys, just zealots obsessed with disease, obsessed with the spreading of disease, and really just singularly dedicated to the Horned Rat and being disgusting piles of festering pus at the same time. Hope no one was eating their lunch while listening to that description. So after that, let's move on to the infantry. First off, let's start with the lowest of the low, the Skaven Slaves. Skaven slaves really are the thing that keep the Under Empire running. They do all the menial chores that any self-respecting Skaven lord could never be bothered to himself. They're miners, they're cleaners, they're cooks, they're all over the place. They essentially run the Skaven Under Empire. Now, you'll see the models here of Skaven slaves are all Skaven themselves. That's not entirely accidental. The Skaven tend to take a lot of slaves from inter-tribal or inter-clan conflicts, and it really is just keep your slaves, or just from parents who abandon their kids to slavery or sell their kids. It's a very uh, unfeeling society. There's a lot of Skaven all the time. I wouldn't go as far as say overpopulation, but you're never going to run out of slaves in Skaven them. As such, there's very little regard given to the lives of slaves. Slaves have been known to live in the Under Empire that are from the other races of the surface that have been taken down and taken as slaves. The only problem with this is they just tend not to survive very long in the horrific conditions that slaves in the Under Empire live in. Only really Skaven can survive in it. And in sort of slave communities and slave dorms, cannibalism is rife. It really is just a horrifically overcrowded place to live. And yeah, they're eating each other at any opportunity. If one like loses an arm or something, he'll probably be immediately devoured by his fellow slaves. It really is just a horrific, horrific way of life. But it's also the way that most of the stuff in the Under Empire gets done. Now, when Skaves happen to chance or be brought up to the battlefield, most warlords really aren't expecting any of them to come back. So they'll really just send the slaves up front, take all the missile fire, take any sort of enemy artillery straight to the face, really just have them waste their bullets on the Skaven slaves. This goes to such an extent 
that Skaven slaves actually have a special rule on the tabletop. Now, if you'll imagine when two uh, units are clashing in a melee fight, most of the time in the tabletop, you're not allowed to fire missiles into that fight uh, for fear of hitting your own troops. It's just not something that any army is allowed to do. However, when Skaven slaves are involved in a melee fight, the Skaven are perfectly allowed to fire their artillery, fire their missiles into that combat because they just don't care about the slaves. What does it matter? The targeting would be a bit strange. You'd have to kind of randomly assign whether the hits would go on the slaves or on the unit they were fighting. So friendly fire, completely acceptable as far as slaves go into it. Now, an issue with the Skaven slaves is that sometimes some would survive, much to the chagrin of their warlord. Really, when the warlord marches a unit of Skaven slaves onto the battlefield, it's really quite handy for him if they just all die. He's already made arrangements to replace them. He doesn't really expect them to go back and refill their slave dormitories or whatever they live in, hovels, shall we say. So that's the idea of the Skaven slaves, really, truly just the definition of cannon fodder. They also have a couple of rules. I explained the expendable rule, where uh, they happen to be able, you can fire into the combat with them. They also have another rule where, like, if their morale broke in the tabletop, and I think this is how this worked, I, I can't remember exactly, but if their morale broke on the tabletop, they would lay down, like, a hit across all units in base contact with whatever was left, and then they would disappear. The idea is that they all die, all the slaves die, but... As they are dying, they're kind of being cornered, and so they have this last little lash out as the frustration of being a horrific life as a slave comes to an end. They have a last little lash out to escape, and they hit the enemies in base contact with them and disappear. That rule was called Cornered Rat, if I'm not mistaken. Quite tricky, maybe not that tricky to implement in Total War Warhammer, but I don't know if it'll be something they'll necessarily want to do and just kind of keep the slaves more as cannon fodder. But that is how they go about it, really. Just taking bullets from both sides, really very unlikely to survive. I think I'd like to see them, if they do appear in the Total War Warhammer 2 Skaven roster, which I imagine they will be as your lowest tier of infantry, um, that they lose a lot of units, but they regen quite quickly. So when you're on the campaign map, you shouldn't have any trouble quickly filling up your Skaven slave ranks again, because as I say, there is ample supply of slaves in Skavendom. So with the Skaven slaves out the way, there's one story about Skaven slaves I want to talk about because I just find it a little bit funny. And that is a story of the famous Skaven slave, Scabicus. Now, Scabicus, much like, you know, you might hear some resounding notes of the name Spartacus in there somewhere, but he led a slave revolt against the Council of Thirteen, and they were like, we've had enough of being slaves in the Under Empire, we're going to take over, it's our time to rise. And much like in the famous film of Spartacus, there came a defining moment when the Skaven leadership, the Council of Thirteen, proposed a deal to the Skaven slave and says, look, you guys, you can all go free if you just show us who Scabicus is, and then we'll kill him, and all will be right with the world. Now, unlike the famous slaves of the Spartacus Rebellion, Skavendom is not filled with brave souls who would risk their lives to their leader, and all of them, without a single detractor, pointed out Scabicus in the blink of an eye. They promptly killed Scabicus and then just kind of put the rest of the slaves to the sword anyway. So very much not a I am Spartacus moment there. But that just goes to show kind of what Skaven are like and a little bit of what the Skaven slaves are like as well. Now, they can be kitted out in a number of varieties. I imagine we'll see a couple of different variants of Skaven slaves in Total War Warhammer 2. They have a hand weapon, they can have be upgraded to a spear, they can have a shield, and they can have slings. Really, a little bit of all of that. I imagine we'll probably see a hand blade weapon and a spear variant. Maybe they won't give the Skaven slaves shields, just because of the idea that they should all be getting mowed down by gunfire. But we'll have to wait and see for the final uh, roster reveal for Total War Warhammer 2 when it comes to the Skaven. That's the slaves, guys. Let's move on to the clan rats. Now, the clan rats really are kind of the warriors, the bulk of any Skaven army, the warriors of any clan. They're, on average, as with Skaven slaves, all Skaven are slightly smaller than your average person. 
But, you know, they're scrawny, they're twitchy, they're a bit all over the place there, but they will bite, gnaw, and stab with the best of the Skaven warriors. However, as with all Skaven, they have not great leadership, not great discipline, particularly cowardly, and not great camaraderie either. If someone happens to be injured or crippled on the battlefield, they'll probably leave them behind at best, at worst, probably eat them on the spot. So that is what happens with the clan rats. But they are fighters. They do take a lot of courage when there's a lot of them around. They like the idea of weight in numbers. And the clan rats, like with all Skaven, love to beat down on those in a lower social position, but will lick the arse of anyone in a higher social position. So if they ever come across slaves or anything, they'll happily beat on them or spit on them or perhaps even eat them from time to time. And whenever a warlord happens to pass by, I'm pretty sure it'll be all, Oh, how are you, sir? Thank you, sir. Please uh, look nicely upon me, sir. May I polish your claws, sir? That kind of thing. So that's the, uh, Claver, the Skaven clan rats for you. They happen to be lightly armored. There are variants, hand weapon, shield, spear again. Uh, all melee folks. I don't think these guys can use slings. But that is the Skaven clan rats, just kind of your average soldier, kind of the equivalent of your imperial swordsman kind of thing. This is the Skaven version. So moving on from the clan rats, we have the Night Runners. Now the Night Runners are warriors from Clan Eshin, like the assassins, but these guys are much lesser trained, kind of like the uh, rookies of the, uh, not necessarily the rookies, but they're just not as good as the assassins, not as well trained, not as able as the assassins. Maybe some Night Runners might might eventually climb the ranks and become an assassin, but for the moment, that's what they are. They're night runners. So, being the most common form of soldier in Clan Eshin, they do stick to some of the same principles of that clan. It's really about speed, about stealthiness, and really about more attack than defense, in all honesty. So, they do sort of sneak around in the shadows. They're best used when coming in from the flanks, like sneaking up on enemies, taking them from the rear, as it were. And that's how one imagines that one should use night runners properly. They're fairly speedy. They can arm. They can be armed with slings and blades, uh, so they can have a missile firing option uh, if you want sort of a sneaky missile unit. So they also have a move called uh, Slinking Advance in the tabletop, which effectively allows them, I, if I remember correctly, to move uh, at the beginning of the turn and just like put them a little bit further forward than they would be able to be otherwise. And the upgraded version of the Night Runners also has a ward save on 6+, which is a 1 in 6 chance of being able to ignore any incoming damage. So these guys are speedy, they're vicious, uh, and they really are doing their best work when on the flanks. So that's the Night Runners for you. The more elite Clan Eshin Warriors are known as the Gusser Runners. Now these guys, similarly in that kind of assassin-like mold, are again very speedy. These guys really get most of the serious work done that Clan Eshin wants done around the world. It's actually thanks to gutter runners doing missions into human libraries and burning all evidence of Skaven them that the humans in the Warhammer world are like barely conscious of their history with the Skaven or the role that Skaven have played in wars with the Empire in the past or even really willing to accept that Skaven are a unique and very dangerous empire in their own right. These guys get all the espionage done, a lot of the assassination done, sabotaging, and they really are just clad in black and ultimate death dealers, really. Uh, these guys are also best used getting around the flank, sneaking up on artillery pieces, really using their speed and their dexterity and their ferocity to take out the more vulnerable units in an enemy army. They're usually armed with two hand weapons. They have the option of taking one of these away and replacing it with something known as a snare net, which would essentially give uh, units fighting them a debuff as a weapon, but replace a hand weapon. So that's what the snare nets would do. Their upgraded versions were known as death runners and could get smoke bombs as an additional skill. But these really are the gutter runners. I think they probably will have stalk in Total War Warhammer 2 and really just a handy infantry unit to move around the flanks, get behind enemy units. They'll probably have vanguard as well, along with the night runners. This is because in the tabletop game, they could also be paired with a unit known as a warp grinder. 
And this allowed them to dig on the ground and kind of pop up in the battlefield in different places. Now, I don't see that exact implementation being brought into Total War Warhammer 2, but I see what they did with the miners for the dwarves and just being able to give them Vanguard is how I think the gutter runners and perhaps even the night runners as well will be uh, able to do in Total War Warhammer 2. So you can really hide them in some forestry, let them get around behind an enemy flank and really start dealing some damage to the soft under belly of any empire or lizard men army they happen to come across. Moving on from the units of Clan Eshin, let's have a look at some of the infantry units from Clan Scryer. Now, these guys are very much the engineers, the inventors of the Skaven world, and one of their units that they tend to train and make are the Poisoned Wind Globideers. Now, these weapons and little bits of equipment were first invented in the Wars with the Dwarves. They found a way to get sort of through their armor by throwing these little globes of poison liquid at them. Now, these globes are usually made of crystal or glass, and once lobbed, they will turn anyone who inhales it flesh into just this bubbling, pus-filled, uh, oozing horrificness. And it will almost sort of slosh off their own bones. That's how deadly these poison globes can be. Now, the poison globe, the poison wind globideers had the ability on the tabletop to actually fire these weapons into units that were locked in melee combat already. So they had a chance of damaging friendly units as well as enemy units, but they had the ability to do so. Even when you charged a unit of them yourselves, now a lot of the tabletop game had to do with ranks and how many ranks who were engaged in an enemy could attack at once. So, say an enemy had engaged a unit of Poisoned Wind Globedeers from the front, they would sharpen ranks, and even the ones in the back who couldn't get an attack in at the front, a normal attack, would still be able to throw their Poison Globes into the enemy. That was a very special rule that they had. So these guys don't really care about friendly casualties either, which will probably mean in Total War Warhammer 2 they have an era of effect, rather than doing sort of less friendly fire damage they could potentially maybe do some serious friendly fire damage but do some truly uh, devastating damage to the enemy as well so that's the poison winds they're just sort of lobbing it by hand their range shouldn't be amazing uh, but they should be able to get a couple of things done do a good degree of damage whilst themselves being protected from the effects of their poisoned wind uh, globes themselves. Now, of course, being a unit invented to fight the dwarves and being a gas that actually goes and affects them, these guys would do armor-piercing damage as well in Total War Warhammer 2. So moving on from the poisoned wind globe deers, we'll stick to our clan scryer theme and we'll move on to the Warp Lock Gisales. Now, I was, I was almost tempted to put these guys in the artillery section, but... Not, I'm not necessarily going to do that. Again, Clan Scryer, when fighting the Dwarves, started to pick up the weapons of the Thunderers, the rifles. And, you know, after a bit of fidgeting and tweaking and really getting it to work properly, they managed to improve on the design and invented the Warp Lock Giselle. Now, these effectively, as the image and kind of gives away, are effectively sniper rifles, but it takes two-man teams to fire one of them, and... It's just the design improved upon the Dwarven Rifles that fires high-velocity refined Warpstone. And this makes them Warpstone weapons, which if you guys remember early in the video I mentioned, deals magic damage. So they will pierce through a shield, pierce through a breastplate, pierce through a body, and go back out the other side. They're that deadly. Now, they have this, this protective, uh, I can never get this word right, but pervase, I think that's how you say it, which will protect them from artillery fire, give them an armor bonus in the tabletop, but I think maybe in Total War Warhammer 2, it'll probably just protect them from missile damage, because if you just go up and kick it over, you're probably right in there and attacking them with your sword or whatever. So, that is the Warp Lock Jadels, another fiendish invention from Clan Scryer, and another invention built upon through the forced innovation they had to do in the war with the dwarves. Now, there's a very uh, good story about these guys and the dwarves when they've been fighting, and that is the story of, I think, Natty Bubo. Now, Natty Bubo, when these first started to come onto the scene, proved to be the best marksman that the Skaven had, and he's said to have been able to nail a dwarf from a huge distance away through their telescopes when they were sort of sighting for artillery and stuff like that. 
Now, the dwarves, being completely unable to accept the notion that these rat men had discovered a way of outranging their own rifles, just kept sending guys up there to look through a bloody telescope, and each one, one after the other, was getting sniped by this guy, Natty Bubo. Now, I think Natty Bubo was probably dead by now, but it just shows, the st I think it's a nice story that highlights the stubbornness of the dwarves and some of the skill that the Skaven marksmen might have uh, going forward when one has to face off against them. Now, these guys were probably going to be particularly dangerous to characters in Total War Warhammer 2, just doing a huge amount of damage. I can't imagine the guys at Creative Assembly are going to give them a very good firing rate because it does take two guys just to fire the bloody thing off and aim it. But I think they will do a lot of damage when they hit, and that's why I think they will be a huge danger to characters, particularly any ethereal units or characters that one might be going for. So, indeed, something to watch out for there. Potentially a very deadly unit. I have no idea, sort of size-wise, what Creative Assembly might do with these guys, but just something to watch out for. So, moving on from the Warp Block Giselles, these deadly snipers of the Skaven army, we are going to go to the Plague Monks. Now, the Plague Monks, I mentioned earlier in the Hero section when talking about the Plague Priests, these are essentially as not quite as zealotous as the Plague Priests, but they follow the same faith and are also members of Clan Pestilence, looking to develop the ultimate disease, consistently writing in, the different, in their different books of woe to combine it together so that one day they can rid the surface dwellers from the world with a horrific disease blessed to them by the Horned One himself. And like the Plague Priests, they are covered in rotting boils, just horrifically infected bandages, and they will continue to squeakily chant and carry the Book of Woe with them into battle. Their banner will more often than not be a rotting corpse that they've caused to rot away through their own horrific concoction of diseases. And just before they launch into battle, their chanting pace will quicken and they will launch into an absolute frenzy with their two hand weapons and just going absolutely mad, seemingly immune to any kind of regular pain until you can chop them down for good. So that's really the Plague Monks. They'll, they'll have Frenzy, they're Zealotous Monks, they won't have much in the way of armor, so missiles will do a lot of damage to them, but they'll be able to do some solid work in close combat if you don't peg them down first. Just being absolute lunatics, even compared to some of the regular Skaven. Now, the most sort of vicious, shall we say, dedicated, perhaps is another adage others might use, of the Plague Monks get to become Plague Sensor Bearers. Now, these guys get the Plague Sensor, which is the weapon you see them holding here, and it is said to be the deadliest weapon in the Clan Pestilence Armory. It's essentially a globe with some warp stone in it, and a ladle of some vile concoction disease, and they just swing it about, causing not only damage from a big swinging metal ball, but also the horrific diseased fumes that pour out of them, just causing huge amounts of horrific damage to any who inhale it. Now, these guys like being vessels for disease, don't forget, so they don't care that they're inhaling it themselves, unlike something like the Clan Scryer Poison Wind Globideers, who, you know, take precautions by wearing masks and things like that. So as these guys swing their sensors into battle, they're smashing shields, and anyone who's inhaling their gas, their flesh erupts into sores, does damage to their lungs, their organs putrefy almost on the spot, just absolutely horrific damage can be done with these weapons and the seemingly almost rhythmic swinging that the plague sensor bearers engage in when fighting for the horned one and for scavendom itself so these guys also have frenzy and they have uh, they have the added bonus of just general hatred which means that they'll probably have a higher melee attack than just your regular plague monks and they'll hit more often and with the weapons they have hit harder and they also have stubborn so they'll stick around in combat even longer so watch out for these guys they're just complete lunatic zealots 
of Clan Pestilence. But as I've mentioned, for our last two uh, units and for the Plague Priests themselves, some of these Clan Pestilence units very well might not make uh, an introduction into the Skaven army until this DLC we're expecting with the Lizardmen and Skaven. Uh, again, if you guys want to check that out, do check the description below. But that's my current thinking. So these guys are on the list of probably most likely not to appear simply because they are dedicated to Clan Pestilence. And that means that they may be held back for a future DLC. So next up, we have the most elite of the Skaven Warriors, the Storm Vermin. Now, Storm Vermin are almost recognizable and distinct from their Skaven brethren almost from birth. They're born bigger. Their fur most often happens to be darker than that of normal Skavens, sort of from a almost a jet blackish kind of hue to it. And they tend to be so strong and big that they're known to, like the Warlords, and many Warlords come from the ranks of Storm Vermin, uh, eat their younger brothers and sisters when they are still in the litter. They are given as the best warriors, the best gear and armor that any Warlord has in his armory, and so are the best equipped of Skaven Warriors. And they also each are so well-renowned that they'll have slaves of their own, these storm vermin, to look after them, to look after their gear, to really just be their servants and to sort of dote upon their every need because they're so revered within Skaven society. Now, in terms of their armaments, they, can, they are armed with halberds. They can be upgraded to have shields as well. So that is the storm vermin for you. Uh, really quite a vicious fighting unit and these will be your elite warriors in Total War Warhammer 2 in the Skaven army as far as melee combat goes. Now as a kind of reputational thing, Clan Rictus is the clan that's known to have sort of the best trained storm vermin in uh, Skavendom. So that might play a part in the themes of the campaign in Total War Warhammer 2. So moving on from the infantry guys, let's take a look at some of the monsters and beasts in the Skaven army. Now, I hear you shouting, but all Skaven are monsters and beasts. Perhaps, but let's have a look at the most particularly monstrous and most particularly beastly units that the Skaven army has to offer. So let's start with the smallest of the beasts in the Skaven army, and that is the Rat Swarm. And really, it's just what it says on the tin. Rats, just like we know them today, live all over the Empire, underneath their cities. And when Skaven armies go on the march, it's said that the normal rats around the world feel some kind of innate calling. And so scurry to beneath the feet of their much larger brethren and serve to aid them in any kind of swarm or formation and attack whoever they're asked to. So that's really just the idea behind the rat swarm. Just some rats who have come to join in the fun with their Skaven brethren. They're, as a swarm unit, they're unbreakable. Uh, but that's really them. They don't block line of sights for missile units or anything like that. Another trait that they have on the tabletop. So... If we see them, I'd be surprised. One, somebody keeps commenting on all my videos whenever I mention a swarm that at some point uh, Creative Assembly have said that they'll never do swarm units in Total War Warhammer. I've never seen that quote myself, but that might be true. So we may never see the rat swarm, uh, but it's a thing and it exists. So there we go. That's the rat swarm. Uh, just kind of a moving carpet of rats that will attack other units. So moving on from the rat swarm, let's have a look at the Great Pox Rat. Now this is a mount I've mentioned a couple of times before. Essentially a giant diseased cavalry rat that warlords and alike can ride on. This is a particularly famous warlord in this model here. This is Nurglich, the leader of Clan Pestilence. And he rides a giant pox rat. Now the giant pox rats have poison damage. So that will be in addition to them if we ever see them as a mount unit in Total War Warhammer 2. So that's really all there is to say about the giant pox rat. Horrific creature, bitey, disgusting, but there we go. Next I want to talk about the pack masters. Now I hear you say, inept general, that's just a normal Skaven guy. Why is he in the monster section? Well he's actually kind of key to a lot of the monsters we have coming up. And often the monsters we have coming up will be accompanied 
by a pack master. He'll give them leadership buffs. He'll also be able to attack in his own right and perhaps to a certain degree stop them rampaging around the place. Now, whether pack masters are ever integrated into these units is something that we may not see in Total War Warhammer 2, but I felt it important maybe just to point out the pack masters and say, okay, these guys do exist on the tabletop. Uh, they do tend to control some of these larger beasts. They give them leadership buffs. They stop the beasts just going mental and running around attacking everything. But I think what we're more likely to get in Total War Warhammer 2 is that some of these larger beasts may suffer from the same thing the lizard men have, which is this rampage mechanic, and might just go off uncontrollably from time to time. But we'll have to wait and see on that one. Maybe pack masters might be introduced just to buff up that leadership a little bit for the larger monsters. So the pack masters are specifically trained, and pack masters tend to originate from Clan Molder. Now, if you consider Clan Scryer the engineers of the Skaven Kingdom, Clan Molder are very much the mad scientists, stroke bio engineers of Skavendom. Uh, that's maybe how I'd describe them. They like to cobble bits of living animals together and, you know, let's just see what happens. That kind of mad Frankenstein-like quality that I'm sure we all have a little of ourselves. Maybe just me. So that's really what Clan Mulder are about. And these guys are trained by Clan Mulder. And in fact, Clan Mulder, when they trade their monstrous beasts that we'll describe coming up later on, tend to sell them along with their pack master leaders as well. And Clan Mulder is really the only clan that can produce enough pack masters to sell along with the beasts. It's said that another clan can actually make pack masters to control some of these monsters. I think that's Clan uh, Kizor in the Darklands, where the sort of the Chaos Dwarves live. But other than that, it's really just down to Clan Mulder to supply the pack masters for all these horrendous animals we're about to see. Now, they have an upgraded version from the pack master known as the Master Molder from Clan Molder. Get it? And uh, they tend to get different weapons. The pack master has a whip more often than not, and the Master Molder, which this chap is on the left, tends to have what they call a thing catcher. So that would give him killing blow on the tabletop. So if we ever see these guys, they might be a potential hero unit even later on. But I, I just don't know. I don't know how they'll be implemented. They could take a number of different approaches with it. But that's really what they're there. They take care of the beasts. They come from Helbit, where Clan Mulder's from. And they often have a whip or a thing catcher just to control the leadership of and the morale of a lot of these horrific monsters. But let's skip them. That's boring. Let's get on to the horrific monsters. Let's start with the giant rats. So, giant rats. You might notice we're going through a theme of size from smaller to larger. So giant rats effectively are rats that have been experimented upon, had like maybe two heads sewn on them, had multiple claws sewn on their bodies, been bandaged, maybe have extra teeth, extra arms, extra legs. Just very huge rats. I mean, compare this model size to the normal rats, and they're almost kind of the size of dogs, effectively. And I imagine in Total War Warhammer 2, they may very much act like the hound units of other armies and sort of go around taking out maybe the missiles of enemy of enemy armies, stuff like that. That's the giant rats for you. They tend to act maybe like piranhas even, being able to devour entire people, entire bodies uh, in just a couple of minutes between all of them. Just this ravenous hunger they have, along with a lot of the actual Skaven themselves, who, you know, after a battle, will eat every dead thing on the battlefield if given half the chance. And they have a couple of special rules, one of which is Rat Pack, which gives them special rules when they're accompanied by a Master Molder or a Pack Master, just helping their morale. And they have something called wave of rats which allows a lot of them to attack at once neither of these are really translatable to total war warhammer but you know just to let you guys know they do have those special rules and they might be used to implement something else in total war warhammer 2 but that's the giant rats getting around size of dogs if you just saw them from a distance and you realize oh my god that's a bloody giant rat Moving on from the giant rats to one of the most iconic Skaven units, the Rat Ogres. Now, this really is Clan Mulder at its best. 
just hobbling bits of pieces together, genetic science, magic, dark sorcery, all kinds of horrific experimentation went on to create these monstrosities. Often they'll have sort of several limbs, two heads, have something maybe mechanical attached to them. They are just horrific and vile monstrosity, the cross between breeding and dark sorcery. They have more often but not been stitched together through random parts, and they're covered in this kind of balm made of warp stone, and that kind of helps them heal and actually become one coherent creature. It really is pretty disgusting. And that these are effectively creatures with the speed of a skaven, which are nimble creatures, and the brawn of an ogre. Just absolute monsters, some significant killing power in each one of these bad boys. They will kill, rip you up, devour you, and are really just incapable of anything else other than fighting and destruction. The uh, pack masters can sort of help control them in a battlefield, but really they are just horrific killing machines with all kinds of horrible mutations wreaked upon them. And really kind of, I think, uh, very much have that old, uh, I'm a monster, please put me out my misery. And then it's like, no, no, just you fight, get into battle, you lazy beast. And then just whip them into shape as they charge into the enemy. Now, of course, as a giant ogre rat running at you after he just ripped your friend in half and tends to be sucking on his intestines, that might cause me to have a little bit of fear. Hope it would cause you to have a little bit of fear too. And indeed, enemy, any enemy soldiers, they do cause fear. They also have frenzy because they are crazy, monstrous, murdering machines. And, as I said, they do get bonuses from being with a pack master. There's also an up, uh, let's say an upgraded version where rat ogres are grown to an even larger size by the masters of Clan Mulder. And they are known as Bonebreaker Rat Ogres. And they're used as mounts that I've mentioned before earlier in the video for some of the characters. So you'll see a Skaven Warlord sitting on the top of one of these giant Rat Ogres. Even big for a Rat Ogre with his little saddle just watching the destruction wrought beneath him by this monstrosity that he's riding on top of. With those beasts out the way, let's move on to the Hell Pit Abomination. Truly... Mwah, the masterpiece of Clan Molder itself. This horrific thing was the result of a very long experimentation where the Skaven were looking for just a monstrously large creature to take onto the battlefield. None of their experiments seemed to work. They would just seem to be limited to a certain amount of size with things like the Rat Ogres and what have you. But a particular, now very well-renowned character from Clan Molder, known as Frot the Unclean, had managed to capture a creature known as a Blind Wirum. And this creature is sort of white, it's just enormous, and it is just this huge blind creature that lives underneath the ground. And having seen this monstrosity, the masters of Clan Mold were like, oh, we can do something with this. And they began to experiment on this trapped poor creature. They began to cut it in half, inject it with huge amounts of warp stone to encourage mutation, and just sort of force fed it, injected it, cut it. In fact, they were so harsh on it, they had to resuscitate it a number of times with some warp lightning, which is lightning from warp stone, to bring it back to life, to continue to torture and abuse and build upon this creature. And eventually they found that only components from rat ogres would even hold on the beast, but they managed to stitch those on rat ogre arms and rat ogre heads and rat ogre legs and tails and attach them to the body of this poor creature and just continue to experiment it until all that was left in the Hell Pit while they're experimenting on what has become known as the Hell Pit Abominations. Just these monstrously huge, vile products of experimentation gone mad, mixed with some engineering, just warp stone being pumped into them continuously, just horrific vile creations that never should have seen the light of day. And as soon as the first one came alive, it immediately went on an absolute killing rampage in the Skaven city known as Hell Pit, killing hundreds if not thousands of Skaven. And when the master molders saw this happen, they were like, 
Yes, boys, we've done it. This is what we need. We need a lot more of these. And they set Throt the Unclean to go and capture more of them so they could breed them and continue to create even more of these true abominations. Now, if you're scared by a rat ogre, understandably, this horrific bastard will terrify you. So they cause terror, they're stubborn, they're immune to psychology, they have a couple of special rules because you know what, Skaven units love a bit of special rules. So they have this rule called Shambling Horror, which dictates how they move around the battlefield. Now, it's not set just because they don't have any kind of regular locomotion in terms of how quickly they can move. So you kind of have to pick a direction and roll dice. It's all very random. If you like Skaven, you like randomness. That tends to be the rule on tabletop. But I don't really see how they could implement it in Total War Warhammer other than perhaps making these creatures susceptible to rampage as well and that might play into the element of randomness we've seen in things like the lizardmen army so far in total war warhammer 2 so that is the hell pit abomination just a absolutely disgusting creature and could only come out of the minds of the most befouled creatures in the warhammer world the skaven so, speaking of randomness and nonsense, let's move on to the artillery and the weapons teams of the Skaven army. Now, one thing that's important to mention as we go through these artillery and weapons teams is that Skaven artillery and weapons have a huge amount of randomness to them, and they can be as dangerous to the Skaven as they can be to the enemy army. They can do all sorts of things like spin around, fire at their own army, explode, take out like a quarter of the Skaven army themselves. Creative Assembly will have a bit of a task on hand because misfiring is not something they've brought into the Total War Warhammer world yet. And nor do I think it necessarily should be because you want an element of predictability in a game like Total War Warhammer 2. And Skaven are not about predictability, particularly their weaponry, their artillery and weapons teams. And each one of these units we're going to talk through can misfire in a way that does potentially devastating damage to the Skaven army itself. How CA really have to consider a way to balance that aspect with the idea of the amount of strength that the Skaven have in artillery and weapons teams when they're actually able to fire. So the only kind of mechanic I can imagine happening is we've seen them be able to play around with the idea of randomness, with the idea of the phoenixes in the high elf army they can resurrect 50% of the time. I think what you almost have to do with the Skaven weaponry is have them misfire say 25% of the time, but not destroy themselves. They just have to go through the process of firing, nothing happens, they reload, and then they have another shot at it. So not every time, timing-wise, they're able to fire should they fire. I think that's really the only way to like balance it and to make it like at least slightly Skaven-y and true to the just rat the sheer chaos that Skaven weaponry can cause on a battlefield. That's my take on it, guys. If you have a different take on it, let me know in the comments. But Skaven are known for their randomness, particularly of their artillery units, and you have to show that somehow in Total War Warhammer. It's such a defining characteristic of their armies, and all of these like lunatic concoctions they've built up in terms of weaponry. So that's something they really do need to add to the game. But they should not be 100% effective. Skaven don't build 100% effective machines. Their machines go haywire a lot, and that should be reflected in the game, at least as far as I'm concerned. I feel we need to explain a little bit here in terms of what a weapons team is. So the Skaven army, when you have a regiment of, say, something like clan rats, which we've gone through previously, you often have the option to team them up with two extra Skaven who will be carrying around a certain piece of weaponry, most often or not a missile weapon or something of the sort. So you have these, and they get bonuses from being teamed up and morale buffs from being teamed up with units. Now, I just can't see that necessarily happening in Total War Warhammer 2 in terms of separate little artillery pieces being tied in and getting buffs whenever they're around a particular unit of clan rats or storm vermin in Total War Warhammer 2. So the way I see them being implemented is either as singular units with just two members in it, just firing off their weapon, or maybe like teams of three or four of them wandering around the battlefield together, really acting more as an artillery 
artillery piece than necessarily what we know as a weapons team in the Skaven army. So you won't have this pairing mechanic. I can't see how they implement that or why they necessarily would. I don't think it would add anything to the game. So I think they'll be separate entities in their own right. So I put them in their own separate sections rather than mentioning them in, in the infantry section. So let's kick things off with the weapons teams then, shall we, while we're on the topic. So the first weapon is one I've actually mentioned that can team up with the Night Runners and the Gutter Runners, known as the Warp Grinder. Now the Warp Grinder effectively drills down into the earth and allows units to pop up in different parts of the battlefield. But as I mentioned, we probably won't see this unit because the Night Runners and the Gutter Runners will most likely just be given Vanguard, and that's kind of their interpretation of these guys armed with the Warp Grinders. Now, the Warp Grinder is a weapon in its own right, but probably more of a melee or short-range focus, so it won't necessarily play into any mechanic in Total War Warhammer 2 or fill any necessary gap in the Skaven army so I think for the most part we will not see the warp grinder in Total War Warhammer 2. So moving on from then let's go on to the Poisoned Wind Mortar. Now much like the Poisoned Wind Globideers which we mentioned before they're effectively firing off the same thing but with bigger poison globes and in a mortar. So it will give you the mortar. You won't have to have line of sight. You're firing up and over as all mortars work in Total War Warhammer. And it has the same horrific effects. One imagines they'll have a much larger area of effect, the Poisoned Wind Mortar. Again, a product of Clan Scryer, but will also be pretty quick, which will be an unusual feature for artillery pieces in Total War Warhammer 2. So the Skaven, these guys can move around and keep pace with regiments of Skaven. So it won't be like a mortar that the Empire have. These guys, I think, will have less impact. Maybe this is why they might still just be singular teams of just two units or maybe just like two uh, mortars going around with four units. Uh, because they have they have to be a little bit rapid on their feet. They can't be as slow as the Empire artillery. Not if they're going to keep thematically with the Skaven army. So they need to be able to keep up and have a bit more versatility, but maybe do less area of effect damage, maybe be less effective than something like a fixed place mortar. Because this is just something strapped to the back of some Skaven. They're quick creatures. They can move about. So moving on from the Poison Wind Mortar, we have the Rattling Gun. Now the Rattling Gun is a machine gun, effectively. A minigun that fires out warp bullets and is really just a whirling machine of death. It's a relatively modern addition to Skaven armies, invented by Clan Scryer, and is powered by warp steam. It's sort of a steam-driven engine that twirls the chambers, fires off the bullets. And like the rest, it does fire off uh, glowing warp stone bullets, so it will probably do magic damage as well. Which means that when fighting Skaven, really magic resistance might play into it a bit more than it has with other armies in Total War Warhammer so far. But these things are rapid and devastating, but they do have a rule that means, uh, on the tabletop at least, which is where they, they can't move and fire. So they have to like take a bit to set up and then fire away. So I think this could be implemented in Total War Warhammer 2 by just giving them a long setup time. Have them move about as quickly as a regiment of Skaven, fair enough, but take, make it give, take them a bit of time to set up before they can start firing at anything. But once they start firing, these guys should start dealing just immense amounts of damage. They're said to be able to just hail down an entire regiment of Orc boys, just absolutely obliterate them. In fact, they riddle their enemies with so many bullets. And as I've mentioned a couple of times, the Skaven have a habit of eating the dead after a battle. But when they come across the victims of the rattling gun, they have a special word for those victims, simply known as teeth breakers. Because once they start digging into their bodies and eating them up, they'll often shatter teeth on the amount of warpstone bullets that have just been embedded in the victims of the rattling guns. So it should be an absolutely devastating weapon. So that's a rattling gunner. Moving on, we have the warp fire thrower. Now these guys will act mm, not dissimilarly to Iron Drake, except they're firing warp fire, which again probably will probably in total war hammer do magic damage as well. Firing off in the tabletop, you would use the flame template. 
Uh, but I think this will be much more like the Iron Drakes and fire in a very similar way to the Iron Drakes in the Dwarven Army. And you'd maybe have two or three of these guys together to form that unit of Warp Fire Throwers. So there we go. That's what the Skaven Warp Fire Thrower does. Flames, Warp Flames, just an unholy mix of chemicals, Warp Stone and Fire. Just absolutely enveloping an enemy army. Probably doing armor piercing because, you know what, you boil in armor. And uh, that's about it. These guys, like all Skaven, do have misfiring things. So they should be susceptible to that, as I said at the top of this section. But that is the Warp Fire Thrower. Next, we're moving on to some actual proper artillery, the Plague Claw Catapult. Now, this is another little contraption coming out of Clan Pestilence. As you guys know, this goes onto my list of things that might not make it into the starting lineup for Skaven, simply because it's being held back for a DLC. But what the story is, is that Clan Pestilence were kind of, you know, they like to be working on their diseases, as we've covered several times so far in this video. And they were just trying to find a better delivery system to get all their horrible diseases and stuff into the ranks of enemy units. And not having perhaps the mechanical invention of their brethren in Clan Scryer, they kind of came up with a rough catapult to begin with that they'd fill with just bubbling vats of carcasses who had died from their diseases and warp stone and just kind of mixed it all together and fired it across into the enemy units, doing huge amounts of damage. And again, as many of the Clan Pestilence weapons does, immediately having people collapse in fever, burst into sores, have boils, start bursting on their skin and just do all kinds of horrific horrific damage to their enemy so this is what they came up with and after the civil war of the skaven clans had come to an end they eventually got together with clan scryer and made some improvements to the plate claw catapult overall making it you know improved range and better firing and that's what the modern plate claw, claw catapults look like uh, today with a little bit of help from their clan scryer cousins but still the uh, payload is equally as virulent and as horrific as ever and this will work very much as we've seen catapults do in total war warhammer 2 so far whether they add some actual bubbling skin pustule mechanic or animation i do not know but it would be horrific to see rather than just seeing them exploding as they do more often than not in total war warhammer at the moment that would be just like seeing the guys go ah covering their face and falling to their knees would be a fun little addition there for the uh, effects of the play claw catapult. So that's what it is. Acts as a catapult, guys. We've seen catapult before. Mixtures of poison and magic and all kinds of horrificness. But again, we may not see this in the starting lineup simply because it is a clan pestilence unit and so may be held back for a DLC. So moving on to perhaps the most iconic artillery unit in the Skaven army, the Warp Lightning Cannon. Now this is pure devastation, just firing out huge bolts of lightning powered by warp stone as so much of the technology is, etched with ancient Skaven runes, and just really just lets loose with a sizzling beam of pure warp energy that fires in a straight line, causing massive amounts of burning damage to anyone who moves into its line of fire. More often than not, manned by an engineer of Clan Scryer, these are just the epitome of Skaven artillery pieces, just absolutely devastating in the right scenarios, and do not get hit by the lightning from this bad boy. Uh, again, this could be famously prone to misfiring in the tabletop game, but as I explained at the top of the section, uh, we'll see what Creative Assembly do as far as misfiring and things like that work for the Skaven army. So let's move on from the artillery pieces, shall we, and move to the... What I've described as chariots, but in some cases chariots, in some cases mounts, just kind of chariots was the best kind of description I could make for some of these units. Um, and the best kind of description as to are the way I imagine them playing in Total War Warhammer 2. So let's kick things off with the Doom Flayer. So the Doom Flayer is actually one of the weapons teams we discussed earlier in the artillery and weapons team section. But because of the kind of uh, thing it is that it's used to effectively run into enemy formations, just start slicing and dicing, doing all sorts of damage, I put it in this chariot section. 
Now, it's not as quick as some of the other units in this section, but effectively it just moves along at the speed of a Skaven Regiment. So it goes along and it can just carve through vast swathes of enemy lines. Now, the Doom Flare was actually invented again, like a few of the other uh, Clan Scryer inventions, uh, during the war with the dwarves and what one particularly inventive engineer of the Skavens had managed to do was cobble together from the ruins of a crashed gyrocopter a rotating motorized iron ball of whirling blades and it was used to just kind of smash into dwarven lines dwarven sieges just tear apart some of their armor and do all kinds of damage. That was what the Doom Flare was invented for. Now it does impact hits when it goes into contact, which effectively is a way of summing up that it's a unit that'll do significant damage on the charge. So it's kind of like a miniature chariot, really, just charging into enemy lines, doing all sorts of mayhem with twirling and swirling blades. One presumes one could add armor piercing to it in Total War Warhammer 2 as well, although technically I don't believe it had armor piercing on the tabletop. But that's it. It's actually quite well defended as well. The idea is that the Skaven can always hide behind this twirling ball of death to protect themselves, so they get quite a high armor value, and they get an extra defensive bonus as well from using this piece of equipment. So in close combat is a fantastically helpful tool to use in the Skaven army, particularly for breaking lines of Dawi and just carving them up with this monstrosity of a machine. So that's the Doom Flayer. I imagine they may play in sort of units of uh, four or five, perhaps, in Total War Warhammer 2, and just charge them in to enemy formations. Uh, they wouldn't be as quick as, say, a cav unit or anything like that, but pretty quick compared to something like an infantry unit. Next up, we have the Doom Wheel. Now, the Doom Wheel is odd because it's also... Uh can be construed somewhat as a chariot, also as an artillery piece, but the Doom Wheel is an ingenious invention of the Skaven, invented by the famous uh, warlock engineer Ikit Claw, and he came up with the idea of this monstrosic contraption. It's a mix of science and sorcery, much like a lot of the mechanical contraptions of Skavendom, and it's just some kind of inhuman ingenuity that it took to cobble this death rolling machine together. When the Empire has come across this unit, they've actually never been able to figure out how it works. The science technically doesn't make sense. From a purely technological perspective, this thing should not work. None of the engineers of Nullen can figure out what is going on, what powers it, how it moves the way it does. It's just baffling to them. So the idea of this machine is there's the treadmill that goes around, covered in a reinforced iron grate, to, you know, just give it that extra whoomph when it charges about the battlefield. And on the front are forked warp tongues of with warp stone on the end that shoot out bolts of warp lightning. Now in the tabletop, every turn, they'd shoot out three bolts of lightning at the nearest enemy. So you wouldn't necessarily be aiming it. It would just do that automatically unless you took uh, actions to prevent that from happening, which you could do as it could kind of impede or get in the way of some of your own troops and stuff like that. It's again one of those Skaven units with a lot of strange rules around it. But what it does is it charges around the battlefield, sparks, and the locomotion itself generates sparks in the warp engine, the warp generator, which powers the warp lightning, which shoots out and just burns enemies upon contact. It kind of unleashes these fumes, which kind of drive the engineer inside a little bit nuts. It gives him a bit more bravery than your typical uh, Skaven might otherwise have. And so he's unafraid to really go charging in and charging about the battlefield. Now, as I've said previously, with a lot of mechanical contraptions the Skaven come up with, this can be equally dangerous to Skaven as it can be to their enemy. And there is elements of randomized movement with the Doom Wheel, not only how quickly it moves, but also kind of in what direction it moves as well so it's just something to watch out for and it can charge into your own units if you're not careful as a skaven player but 
Skaven players are aware that's something you need to watch out for and you try to keep it separate from all of the rest of your army both in the lore and somewhat in the tabletop as well but it fires around crushes opponents under its enormous tread it darts around the battlefield and because it's kind of powered by this treadmill and things whirling around it whether it be rats or skaven themselves or whatever's powering whichever version of the doom wheel you have They've tried all sorts of things by giving the creatures in the treadmill stimulants, by just trying to keep them going and running as quickly as they possibly can, to try and give the Doom Wheel a slightly consistent pace. But it all seems to fall apart, giving the Doom Wheel very randomized movement. Now, there's no real way in Total War Warhammer you could do that. I think you'd have to give it a relatively steady movement. I don't think you could beat it up and slow it down like at random. That'd be a bit strange, although possible, I suppose. But it'd be a very strange unit to have. But that's something they could implement. It's just depending how crazy Creative Assembly want to get with some of this Skaven stuff. They could go all out and just completely randomize the movement of the Doom Wheel, having it go really quick and then slow down and go really quick while you're trying to get it to where you want it to go. But it's a fairly sturdy piece of equipment. It has a good armor save. It has a good level of armor. It's immune psychology. As it's a wheel of chaos that kind of goes around spewing out bolts of lightning. It causes terror to the units around it. It has impact hits, which means it will have a very mean charge on it. Uh, so really all around, it would act very similarly to a chariot, except a chariot that shoots out like an artillery piece, but can also go crashing through lines if need be as well. And mostly in close combat, it would be using its tread to just grind down enemies in front of them and squish them. That's really how it goes around fighting in close combat. But you want to try and take advantage of the bolts that it shoots out as well. So all around, a great little piece of equipment. A quick, at worst, a quick moving piece of artillery. At best, a quick moving piece of artillery that will run over anyone who tries to take it out. So that is the Doom Wheel, quite a nasty piece of equipment and a truly iconic piece of Skaven equipment as well. I don't see them skipping out on this particular um, item, but then again, they didn't give us the Salamanders and the Lizard Men, so you never do know, but I'm pretty sure the Doom Wheel will make the cut in Total War Warhammer 2. Moving on from the Doom Wheel, we have the Plague Furnace. Now, this is where things might get a little bit strange because... We're dealing, the next two units we're going to be dealing with are units that are typically in a Skaven army carted around within another unit. So the Plague Furnace would have a Plague Priest on it, and it very much acts as the mount for a Plague Priest. But around it, you'd also have Plague Monks, and they have special rules that play off against each other. For example, if Plague Monks are near the Plague Furnace, they become unbreakable. So you could still have it giving bonuses to the Plague Monks, but it's a very specific thing to be doing, and a very specific unit to be giving bonuses to. So unless you were encouraged to have things like Clan Pestilence-themed armies, which you may do in Total War Warhammer 2, we don't know yet, it's tricky to get the most out of something like the Plague furnace and also being a unit from clan pestilence this is a unit i suspect may not make an appearance until the dlc that i've discussed previously in this video and in my future dlc video which you'll find in the description below if you've skipped ahead to this chariot section but effectively being the mount of the Plague Priest, it is again a disease-ridden altar, the wood's meant to be like half rotting on it, completely like infested with half-dying woodworm, just crawling all over the machine. It's being pushed by chanting monks for the most part, and it has this massive iron ball on it, much like a massive version of the Plague Monk uh, sensors, which we uh, discussed before in the infantry section. So it has warp stone thrown in there, as well as whatever vile disease concoctions the plague monks have managed to cook up. And they place it in just this massive ball, which they swing back and forth as they move along the battlefield, charging towards the enemy. As such, it doesn't really have independent locomotion. So unless you just built it with the idea that there are plague monks in front pulling it along or something along that, Creative Assembly might have to get a bit weird about how exactly this thing will move by itself if it's not embedded in a unit of plague monks i'm sure it won't it's not an impossible solution you could just put monks around it and have them seemingly like they're all tied with ropes to it and they're pulling it along that's perfectly plausible but 
just interesting to see how they get around that problem. This thing is swinging back and forth. Again, like the uh, sensors of the plague monks before, it poisons people, it does huge amounts of damage, and so they go along with this and it just causes plague monks to go extra crazy. They already have frenzy, but the fumes from this thing coming off, it would kill most un pestilence like things, but they're just getting revved up, they're enjoying their chanting like, yeah, 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 this is some great disease we've got here. Let's bloody go for it, lads. Let's go for it. And so when they charge into an enemy with this, this will do impact attacks. So it should have a good charge on it when it's made, when it's implemented in Total War Warhammer 2. And it also has magic resistance as well, which is a bonus it could have and give to those around it. But as I said, it makes plague monks unbreakable. So it essentially makes frenzying monks, who otherwise have morale, like much of the Skaven units, unlike the flagellants, say, of the Empire, which are kind of the same mold, like zealotous religious zealots, they won't break, whereas plague monks will break unless this thing is along with them. So this comes along, pendulum swinging back and forth, and as they charge into an enemy, the spikes at the front of this massive chariot mount will hit them, and the plague monks will loosen the chain, letting this massive ball of disease and smoke and warp stone kind of go hurtling forward and land, crushing anyone who's underneath it in the enemy unit. And then they'll wheel it back in with the chain, start swinging it again, and then lob it out there. Now, the animations for this thing could look particularly spectacular in Total War Warhammer 2. How far they actually go with it rather than making it maybe just the morale boosting uh, chariot or cart uh, if you will is beyond me but I would love to see this actual animation happening of the uh, ball just being unleashed and landing bang crushing a whole bunch of units then being pulled back in I think that'd be great very tricky to animate but great to see and so yeah the plague monk can use it as a mount potentially doing magic off of it as well and it really is a handy unit particularly if you have a plague monk themed army so it's going through, it does billowing death, which acts as a kind of breath weapon. We've seen them before, which is a skill it has. And really just a great mount for plague monks, for the plague priests. Combine them, can be a very effective fighting force together, um, lending them the special rules of being unbreakable, and just doing damage with that ball landing in the middle. But that's really the Plague Furnace, just a moving viral delivery system doing all kinds of horrific damage, geeing up the Plague Monks, geeing up the Plague Priest, being a mount for him, uh, which we will probably see when they're introduced, and just causing all kinds of havoc and horribleness, much like Skaven are wont to do. The next and final unit of the Skaven army we are going to cover is the Screaming Bell, another truly iconic unit of the Skaven army. This is the mount for a Gracia, which we've seen before, but much like the Plague Furnace, which we just covered, I imagine we may get the Screaming Bell and the Plague Furnace, much like the Corpse Cart of the Undead, as both mounts and potentially individual units you can buy as well that will have very similar effects except without the hero attached. That's kind of how I see them implementing them. Now the bell has huge significance in the Skaven creation myth. Now humans can only kind of guess at it but there is a Tillian story of the Doom of Kavar, I think is how you pronounce it. Now, Kavar was a great ancient city located between the lands of what are now Tilia and Estalia, located right in the middle there, where now there seems to exist only a swamp and the perhaps rumors of a city shrouded in mist. But Kavar was said to be once a gleaming light of civilization, a city so old it predated the birth of both men and dwarves, but together they lived in the city truly harmoniously. The dwarves carved out the massive mineral wealth beneath the city, while the humans lived in wonderful climate above, growing vast amounts of crops, and they lived together in harmony for many, many centuries, both profiting and happy and living together. And this was the great city of Kavar. And to honor their gods, the manlings had decided to build a great temple to their gods and build it so high it was pierced the heavens. 
They spent many, many years working on this temple, building an ever higher and higher tower. It's said that men were born, lived, worked their entire lives on the tower, and died before its completion. That's how long they spent on it. Eventually, they got to such heights that they could no longer haul stone to that level, and they thought they would never be able to finish their tower as intended. Upon that evening, a stranger cloaked in grey robes appeared, and promised the men, if you allow me to add a vestige to my own god at the top of your temple, I shall finish this temple for you within the evening. Seemingly having nothing to lose, the men of Kavar agreed, and so he sent them to bed and said, come the morning, your tower will be complete. So some kind of strange darkness enveloped the top of the tower, so the men could not see what was going on up there. But indeed, come morning, the tower had been complete. And what stood at the very apex of the tower was an enormous horned bell. And this must be the thing that the stranger added. But having finally sort of reached the height of the tower as intended, the men were okay with it and sort of reveled and all went into the tower. But at the moment, they all sort of got in there and started to rejoice at what they'd managed to finally finish after generations. Their bell at the very top of the tower began to ring once, twice, three times, continuing to ring till at last it struck the final time on the 13th count. By that time, the noise had grown so loud, the men had retreated back to their homes. It had become so loud and disorientating and uncomfortable. But it's thought that this ringing summoned an enormous dark storm that gave birth to ashen rain that would fall constantly, black rain, without allowing the sun to penetrate at any point. Soon the crops of the men withered and died, and they asked the dwarves for help, but the dwarves turned them away. The storms continued every night, and every day the bell would ring 13 times over and over again, and the storms began to get progressively worse. Rain turned to hail, hail turned to hail so large it could be construed as near meteorites, and in desperation the men turned to the dwarves one more time, begging them for their help, but the dwarves had said even their lower chambers had begun to be flooded, and they had no food to spare of their own. The crops had withered and died in the fields, and the vast stores that Kavar had were being eaten away by huge roaming packs of ravenous vermin, just eating away all their food stores, and they couldn't kill enough or chase enough away. The vermin just grew and grew and grew in number. And so eventually, it just got to desperate measures. They sent men out for help, but no one who was sent beyond the boundaries of the city territory ever returned. And so the men were desperate, and as they began to grow more hungry, more crippled, more sick, the vermin started to feed on men themselves. At this point, desperation clutched the men, they armed themselves, and began to knock on the gates of the dwarven part of the city once more, who had been sealed to them since they were sent away. And in just a sheer desperation, they're like, the dwarves have food, we have to get in there, they battered down the gates of the dwarven part of Kavar, only to find Kavar abandoned. Eventually, once they began to explore the depths of Kavar, they found the bones of dwarves, gnawed at and eaten and devoured by the rats that had haunted them above ground as well. When they tried to escape, they found their route cut off, and eventually, after enough time, their torches began to flicker and dim, and that's where they saw set after set of yellow verminous eyes staring back at them in the darkness and one by one as the darkness began to envelop them all the men of, of the once great city of Kavar began to be devoured alive by this endless horde of vermin and this horde is what fought to, to become one day the Skaven Under Empire thanks to the cloak stranger and the mystical bell that rang 13 times every night, allowing the rats to rule what would become Skaven Blight. And so the bells play a very important role in Skaven creation. I hope you guys don't mind me launching into a little story there. 
but they love the idea of their bells, they love the number 13, it plays a distinct role in their society. Now, whether Skaven believe that creation story or they have another version of it, we don't know. That's just an old Tillian story that was passed down. However, it is thought that each of the screaming bells forged today contain a small piece of that original bell forged into itself, keeping some of that original magic that allowed the Skaven to be born into the Warhammer world. Now, when these bells are forged, not only do they contain a part of that original bell, but there's a whole ritual involved whereby graciers gather around the bell as it's being cast and runes start to burn into its side as the magic they kind of infuse it with takes hold. So these bells have a lot of mysticism about them, a lot of magic about them. And they're developed by a combination of the Graciers, the Warlock Engineers of Clan Scryer, and they work together to forge these bells today. As a means of locomotion, these screaming bells are most normally pushed along by a set of rat ogres. So these monstrosities in Total War Warhammer 2 will probably appear pulling this thing along, probably beside it rather than in front of it, and they will help it charge into combat where necessary. Really, what the Screaming Bell is, is an altar to the gods of Skaven, the Horned Rat, as the Horned Bell represents his worship. And this horrific contraption is a fear-inducing machine. It has magic resistance. It also does impact damage, suggesting it should probably have a fairly powerful charge in Total War Warhammer 2. Now, there are a couple of random effects that the bell has, but let's talk through the effects, and I imagine in Total War Warhammer 2, there'll probably be an aura effect that envelops all of these different effects that the bell can have on people. So what would happen in the tabletop is you'd roll a dice to see what the bell's doing, what effect the bell will have that turn. Now, that turn, if you roll a 1, it does nothing. If you roll a 2 to 4, it allows extra movement of the bell. Uh, to, to the level of d6, so it's effectively being able to almost double the speed of the bell itself. On a 5 to 8, it would embolden, which is essentially a morale boost to the units around the bell within a certain distance. It would allow them to re-roll failed leadership tests, so stopping them from running away or for having any kind of fear effects upon them, stuff like that. On a 9 to 10, it would cause scorch, the, the idea that it opens up vents and scorches nearby enemy units. On an 11 to 12, it would be uh, deafening, and that essentially is wounds to, to units around it. On a 13, it's a strike from, the ve from beyond the veil, so the idea that just enemy units are taking damage as well. On a 14 to 16, it's an unholy sound where it gives a boost to your own units around it by giving them extra attacks and it would cause buildings to collapse around it. So very helpful for perhaps taking down a wall or two. Now this I think will be a, an ability actually given to the Screaming Bell as a non-magic linked ability because we've actually had them tell us about an ability that the elves have called Vol's Hammer, which is a magic spell the elves can cast to actually destroy bits of wall in a siege. Now that makes it very interesting because that means that potentially the screaming bell could also collapse walls in a siege-like situation because if the elves have it why not give the ability to skaven as they have one with this screaming bell so potentially a hugely useful piece of equipment during a siege so that's how i see the unholy sound rule being implemented and then 17 is avalanche of energy again giving boosts of attacks to units around you and giving damage to enemy units around you as well on an 18 what would happen is the bell would essentially explode killing the units carrying it so those are kind of interesting elements i don't think they'll do an explosion where the bell self-destructs i don't think that really fits with total war warhammer but what I do see happening is effectively there are some themes in the stuff the bell does. So it gives people extra attack. So that would be effectively in Total War Warhammer 2 a boost to melee attack. It does damage to enemy units. And on some rolls it does damage to your own units. But it does damage to enemy units. So an aura of damage. We've seen that happen with the Mortis Engine. And it gives morale buffs as well. So I think really you could encapsulate what the Screaming Bell does by allowing it to 
do damage to enemy units within a certain radius, grant melee attack bonuses, and grant uh, leadership bonuses or morale bonuses to nearby units you have as well. And if it did all those things, it'd be a fair enough representation, as well as doing the unholy sound ability where it could collapse buildings or perhaps even collapse a bit of a wall in a siege as a perhaps cooldown ability or a one-use ability, something like that. So that's how I see the Screaming Bell potentially being implemented in Total War Warhammer 2. As well as that, it has a number of other rules. It uh, grants the protection of the Horned Rat, and as I mentioned, it's a mount for the Gracier General type, and so it gives them a 50% ward save effectively. So as a mount, yes, it could give them a ward save. As the altar of the Horned Rat, it also grants the bravery to the Rat Ogres pushing it along, making them unbreakable. Now, if you incorporated Rat Ogres into the unit itself as a way of locomotion, then it would just be an unbreakable unit in its own right. I think that would be a fair enough translation. And above the masses is another thing it can do, whereby it allows the Gracia to kind of climb up the bell is how it's described and so he's up there so no one can challenge him to a duel if there's another leader in the unit it's charged or being attacked by and he can fire off magic in a 360 degree area of attack so that's the idea of the screaming bell a lot of different buffs it gives around there and maybe even the unbreakable thing could be extended to a radius uh, element as well sorry that one took a bit of a long time guys it's quite an iconic unit and it allowed me a little time to tell the Skaven creation myth as well. But that about sums it up, guys, for our Skaven army units video. Hope you enjoyed that one. I'm really looking forward to how they implement the Skaven. It's a hugely randomized army. There's a lot of crazy stuff that happens when you play as or against Skaven in the tabletop. I'm really looking forward to seeing the Skaven in the game. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, guys, please do drop a like. Please do subscribe. Really helps the channel out. Helps us grow. And as always, I'd like to wish... A a special thank you to my patrons, John, Reese, Colin, Matthias, Samuel, Mathies, David, and Peter. Thank you guys for supporting me, and thank you guys all for watching this video, and I look forward to catching you on the next one.